You're listening to the Coach Hodge and Bank Show on the Coaching Culture in Athletics Radio Broadcast Network. Sit back and enjoy the show. The views and opinions discussed in this podcast aren't necessarily the opinion of the host or Coach Hodge and Bank Show on the Coaching and Culture Athletics Network. All right, I want to welcome everybody to tonight's uh, CCA uh, episode 12 tonight. Uh, coach Swanson and I have head uh, ADM football coach Garrison Carter. Topics for tonight's broadcast are going to be creating a winning environment, what makes a winner, non-negotiables, coaches that have impacted us along the way, and culture, of course. Sit back, uh, turn the AC up, and enjoy the show this evening. Now I'm going to unmute uh, these fine gentlemen here. And you hear that boom, Garrison, buddy. It's it's good to have you, my friend. Uh, you know, I I, I know that uh, uh, some sometimes you hate to toot your own horn, but tonight I'm going to toot it for you. How about that? That sounds good, guys. I appreciate you having me on. Oh, absolutely. Now, uh, for for those that don't know you, and, and we do have a lot of people from you know our Centerville hometown area that uh, that that watch here and there. But those that don't know who you are, Garrison, fill them in on a little bit of your background. You know, kind of when this coaching thing started way back when, and in Seymour in that small town. Yeah, for sure. Well, you know, I guess to start all the way back, you, you touched on it. I, I graduated from Centerville High School. Actually, played. You were one of the coaches there when we played. So probably why I'm on this podcast tonight. Um, then decided I wanted to keep trying and play or play football at the next level and went to Simpson College and, and had two good years there before I got hurt. And, uh, you know, that ended up being being a huge blessing for me. I, I got injured and then going into that offseason, uh, the coach that had recruited me there left and they brought in a new coaching staff. And, um, you know, I was kind of the guy that just wanted to hang around the football offices all day and, and uh, kind of formed a relationship with the new guys that came in and ended up, long story short, ended up getting a student coaching job with them and, and finished my college career out. Uh, as a student assistant coach, um, that led me to led me to getting hired as the head coach at Steemore right when I graduated. So, uh, 21 years old, and I was a head football coach, and I, I thought it was the greatest thing in the world. And uh, you touched on it. I was at Seymour, which at the time was the smallest football playing school in the state, uh, an eight man program. Uh, took over them. They were coming off an 0 and 9 season, which I think it was back to back 0 and 9 seasons actually, which is probably why it was available. And we went four and five in that first year, and, and man, we thought we thought we were the greatest coaches in the history of time. So, uh, left there, went and tried at my tried my luck at the college level, and went to Dort College, which is up in Northwest Iowa. Uh, spent about two weeks there before I realized that that the college thing wasn't for me, and I wanted to be, get back to being a head coach and, and at the high school level as fast as possible. Uh, finished out spring ball there, got a job at Ogden High School, was there for two years. Uh, Got him to ten and two, and went and made it to the quarterfinals, and left there, and went and spent four years at Washington High, High School down by you guys. And uh, after year four, my wife and I decided it was time to, to find a place where we wanted to be for a long time and get back closer to our families. And uh, getting ready to start year number two at ADM, and, and hopefully we'll be here until they fire me. So hopefully it'll, <laughs> it'll be a while. You know, you know, it's uh, it's it, it, it's a lot of fun to joke around about that sort of stuff, but it's amazing. Uh, how, how many times you're, you're you're seen as the greatest thing uh, since sliced bread, and then the next year you're not. You know, it's one of those things when you're talking about coaching he- football. It, it's a daily thing. It, it goes back and forth, right? So uh, it's one of the fun things. You know, we're we're in the accountability business, and and, and people are going to hold us accountable just like we'd hold the kids accountable. So it's okay. But uh, but you're right. So hopefully, we make more people happy than upset. You know, I, I, I go all the way back. I, I can remember, I, I'm not sure whether or not you were, I, I think you were a senior on this team. We, we were at Washington. And then uh, this, uh, you remember this, the, you know, Coach Knott turns around and says, hey, we're going to kick this field goal. And, uh, and, and Hindley kicked that field goal. And I think that was the last time that, that, that Centerville beat Washington at Washington. Yeah, I, I remember that vividly. Caught two touchdowns in overtime, both called back for a legal man downfield. <laughs> Oh, I, I, you know, you know, Coach Swanson. I, I remember, uh, you know, uh, the the coaches were just all shaking their heads. It was, it was pandemonium 
you know, when you look at that. So nah, it was fun. And it, it was a good story to tell when I got, got to Washington. So, uh, yeah. Oh man. So, so you've, uh, you, you, you went into programs, some of the programs, uh, you know, that they, they had storied, you know, backgrounds, but a couple of those programs, you know, we, we, we look at where you, you had to do a lot of footwork, uh, you know, and, and a lot of work in order to change, uh, the, 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 the big picture when you, when you look at, uh, you know, high school football. Now I, I, I really see this in you and, and I'm going to toot your own horn here because I've had a, an opportunity to coach football for a long time. I've, I've seen you, you know, all the way through your coaching ranks. And you know, what, what I see out of you, uh, Garrison is a couple of important factors. Number one, when Garrison Carter comes to town, he's all freaking in. Okay. Garrison Carter is going to give you 150% of his mind, ability, and brain. And he's going to push that. And he's passionate about football because he loves it. And, and I think that a lot of times you can roll into, you know, these schools that, you know, may, maybe, maybe they've, they've had talent, but they've, they've lost that drive and that passion. And, and Garrison, I, I have to give you props for that. Well, I appreciate that. Yeah. I think, uh, so this is my fourth school I've been at. Uh, and hope, like I said, hopefully my last school. And I think I've, I've been on the complete polar opposites. Three of the four I've gone to are coming off 0 and 9 seasons, right? There's a reason they're they're open. And then the other one I took over for Randy Schrader at Washington right after they were in the state title game. So uh, it just uh, it's it's been a, a crazy ride, I guess. And, and um, you know, I loved my time at Washington. Some of my best friends in the entire world were from there on that coaching staff with us. But um, you know, there's just I'm, I'm kind of a builder by nature, you know. So I. There's just something fun about taking over a program that's kind of a blank slate and, and, and needs a little kick in the pants to get going. And, and that's, I think, what we had going on here. And it's been, it's been really fun these first couple of years. Now, what, what do you suppose uh, that, that you did differently at each job in order to shift uh, your style of coaching culture within your organization? I mean, it, it, it varies from school to school, but uh, what, what have you done a little bit yeah. differently? Well, I think, I mean, so, so one of the things that I kind of try and pride myself in is to, to steal the Al Davis, uh, you know, twist on the golden rule, which, you know, most people think the golden rule is to treat everyone the way you want to be treated. But I think in the business we're in it, the, the golden rule is to treat everyone the way they want to be treated. And, you know, and, and I think that, you know, that's easy to say, but, but it's hard to do. And it, and it has to be different everywhere you go and every year within the school you're in, you know? So, um, we're trying to be really intentional about for, forming relationships with kids and getting to know what makes them tick and, and, uh, and trying to build them off that. But, you know, I mean, there, there's kind of been some consistent things everywhere we've gone as far as trying to create a winning environment. And, uh, you know, I think the three big things would be, uh, you know, we have to be really intentional about everything that we ask our kids to do. Um, for instance, I just got, got done, uh, sending an email out to parents uh, as to our why, uh, you know, why do we play music at practice? You know, and I think you got to have, uh, if you can't justify why you're doing something and really making sure that it's making your kids and program better then you shouldn't be doing it. You know, so we really believe that everything matters and that uh, we're going to make sure we're doing the right thing for, for our program and for our kids. Uh, you know, I think the next one, and this is the one where I'm on the right podcast to talk about this. because I, I think, uh, you know, so many football coaches think the number one thing is, you know, what offense are we going to run and what defense we, are we going to run? And, you know, I think we are really understanding of the fact that X's and O's are really insignificant in the grand scheme of, you know, of building a championship level program. You know, we, we play nine games a year and we're with these kids 365 days a year. You know, so what are you doing when you're not calling plays? I, I, th- I think goes a long ways. Uh, and then the last one is, you know, we got to be able to teach our kids to constantly be mentally tough and, and how to respond to adversity, and, you know, not just on the football field, but just in life in general. Because I think when you start getting mentally tough and resilient kids, good things are going to happen. You know, I, I, I believe you, uh, you know, are, and, and I agree with you 100% when you talk about the passion, building those relationships and forming that bond. Now, I, I do have to ask this, you know, as, as a coach uh, as well. How, how on earth can you get those parents to buy in so well at virtually every program? You know, I get that question a lot, and, and if you want the honest truth, I don't know. I, I, I think I, you know, I, I think we're an open book. I think we're really genuine and honest about everything we do. Um, you know, I'm a big believer, and this is a, an old coach not thing, but uh, you know, I, I don't think you can over communicate. You know, and so we try to make sure everything we're doing is communicated at home. We're letting the parents. I mean, it's it's not my football program, right? It's our community's football program. So trying to make sure that we get everyone involved and everyone feels like they have a voice and and can be, you know, around our program. And I, I think that goes a long ways. I, 
I don't think it, we definitely, we have the complete opposite of the us against the world mentality. You know, it, it's, it's ADM all in together. And, and I, I think that goes a long ways. Uh, Coach uh, I, uh, Swanson, I don't want to leave you out if you have any questions at this point. Oh, no, go ahead. I mean, he, he's saying some great stuff. You know, one thing, one thing I will ask, you know, you said you got your first head coaching job at the age of 21. You know, going into that, no matter, you know, what size of school it, you know, it was, what was your mentality being that young and taking over a program, no matter how small it was? Well, you know, I, I think that, again, you know, I, I didn't know any better. I didn't know any better to any different to think that wasn't the best job on the planet. I was just ecstatic to be a head coach. And, and of course, I was 21 years old and thought I knew everything and, and it was going to be really easy. And, uh, you know, I kind of just went in with that mentality, guns blazing, and, and this is what we're going to do. And, you know, again, I mean, gosh, it's been 10 years now, but I, I thought I was king of the world going to see more Iowa after I had two years of coaching at a college level, you know. So, um, you know, now I wish if, if I if I could go back and, and smack – 21 year old me in the face, I would probably do it. Cause I'm sure I was, did a lot of stupid things and a, and a lot of things that, that aren't anywhere close to what we're doing now. But it, I, again, I, I've kind of had an odd path, you know, I rarely been, you know, I was an assistant at the college level, never been a high school assistant, only been a head coach and kind of had trial by fire and figured it out as we've gone. So. Yeah. And you know, you know, you know, you, you, you look at you back then and, you know, versus now I, I see, I see a lot of the same spark, a lot of the same desire, but I do see a lot of maturity. You know, when it, when when you're talking about running, you know, an, an elite football program, and and I totally appreciate that. Um, well, that's good. I think, I think my wife's listening to this, so she'll be happy that you t- said I was really getting mature and growing up. She probably disagree. So, well, that's the, that's the way it is. My, I, I'm sure my wife Stephanie would say the same stuff about me, and here I am rolling almost to that fifty doormat. So. <laughs> it's one of those things. Um, back back in Seymour, did you guys score a hundred points, or did you have a hundred points scored against you? I couldn't remember. No, that was the that was the game before I got there. So week nine of the year before I got there, they got beat. It was a state record, one hundred and twelve to nothing. Again, there's a reason jobs are open, right? So <laughs> that, was, that was the game before I got there. We had one uh, against Moravia when I was there that I, I think was some sort of like combined scoring record when Moravia had that really good team and was ranked number one, and we got beat on a last-second touchdown to them, 71-68. to 68. <sighs> Kind of really playing into those eight-man scoring stereotypes with that one. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's it, it, it's got to be a lot of fun. Now, what, what was the transition like moving from the eight-man up to the 11-man? You know, I get that question a lot, too, and, and – um, you know, if you want to know the truth, some of the schemes and, and terminology we were using at SEMO, we're still using today. You know, uh, I, I think the eight-man game does get kind of a, a bad rap. It's an, a spread it out, uh, throw it all over the place thing. And that, that really wasn't the case for us. You know, we're, we're running the exact same stuff now um, that we are here. And we're still going to be a, a power spread run first team, just like we were there. Um, you just take out the tackles and a fullback, you know, and you, you go with, with what you're doing. So um, I guess I never thought that was that big a deal. Yeah, I, I I don't know whether I could go down and coach eight. Well, I probably could, but uh, I, I I'd be a little bit nervous, you know, especially especially coming from that uh, that that run heavy offense that 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 I've been around pretty much in my entire career. Now, what makes uh, a, a a football program a winner? What what does it take? Well, you know, I, I knew you were going to ask me this question, and I thought about it a lot, and. and you know, God, you hopefully don't kick me off the podcast for saying this, but you know, first of all, I think there's a big difference between being a winner and being successful. You sure. know, so I, it took me a while. I had to kind of think through that process, and you know, but I'm probably in the minority. I, I, I at the end of the day, I think what makes you a winner is winning, right? Finishing for in first place. And I know that in the entitled society we live live in now, you know, sometimes that's frowned upon to say that you know we expect you to try and win, but. Um, I, however, I guess I don't believe necessarily that winning and losing is a good measure of success, you know, and I, and I, I guess I think success is if you put your best effort into absolutely everything you can possibly do into something and you know that you got better during that process, then I think you're successful. So, um, you know, I guess from that question, if, if that's what you're wanting, you know, I, I guess, I, you know, what if we feel like we won the day at practice or we were successful that day at practice if every single one of our kids leaves practice better than they got there. Um, and so again, I think that's our definition, definition of success, but at the end of the day, I think what makes you a winner is by winning. So. Sure. Sure. And, you know, we, we, we do live in that society where, you know, everybody gets a trophy at times and and I know I'll catch a little bit of slack, 
you know what I mean, from a few listeners okay, out I'll, there. I'll take it. You, I, I can. I fight that battle all the time. That's not a problem. You can throw them away. <laughs> How? Okay. So, so, and and this this isn't a question I gave you, and I and 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 if you don't want to answer it, you can say, uh, Coach Banks, I'm not going to answer it. It's one of those things. Um, uh, what? How, how do you deal with a parent uh, in, in, in both a, a winning environment and uh, when, when you're winning and you're losing? Uh, how, how do you deal with that mad parent? Uh, and when I'm talking about mad parent, I'm talking about the parent that could be uh, like overly, uh, you know, where, where they're communicating with you, may, maybe a little bit too much or, you know, or, you know, it, and it could come across as being overly nice, whatever. I'm talking about right. that, that mad society that we live in today. When you talk about, you know, whether it's the community, the officials, the the coaches, or whatever, in, in, right. in this mad culture. Yeah, well, so again, I, I, I'm probably in the minority, but I'll answer a parent phone call or a parent text or a parent email anytime. And, uh, you know, but the first thing that we lay out in our, in our parent player meeting is we have a specific protocol for how those conversations have to go. You know, so if you're reaching out to me, so I will answer any question at any time about our program. You know, if you want to know, hey, why do you practice on Thursday mornings or uh, why do you do whatever you do? Right. And I'll answer those questions at any time. It, the, the thing is that I won't talk about um, another kid. So mm-hmm. if any parent ever, which, you know, and by having that rule in place, that, that kind of eliminates the my kid should be playing over that kid conversations, you know, that, that you hear a lot of horror stories about. And, and we've been lucky to not have many of those. And I think it's because of that, you know. If you say, I'm not going to talk about any other kid, so then literally all parents can come and do is ask questions about our program. They can ask questions about opponent, or they can ask, what can my kid do? How's my kid doing personally? And those questions are always easy to ask, I think. If, if you're a head coach and you can't justify any of those responses, then, then I don't know what the heck you're doing. So um, I guess I don't know if that's the answer you wanted, but that'd be kind of the, the roundabout way of, of how we deal with parents. Oh, I, and, 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 I, and I think that's, that's important to be approachable. And uh, and this, that, and the other. Uh, Coach Swanson, what do you think about that? You know, I think that's a very interesting concept. And so I got to ask, because you said you're in the minority of doing that, and you're right, you probably are. Why did you decide to take that approach? Did you just want to be more straightforward with the parents? Has, have you seen more success that way? Um, you know, again, a lot of these questions probably go back to I never was an assistant, and I didn't know any better. And I thought when parents called me, I had to answer. And that now I've never changed. <laughs> you know, I, got, I wish I had a good reason and a good rationale for, for why I do. But I guess, I, again, I just I feel like I, I, I'm really passionate about our program and our kids. And I'll talk to about anybody that wants to talk to them. You know, so if, you know, I guess I feel like if you're going to be a leader and you're going to be a public figure in a community and, and, you know, as egotistical as this sounds, you know, the head coach in, in a 3A community in Iowa is a pretty big deal, you know, and you better be able to mm-hmm. look, figure and answer phone calls and answer questions or else uh, you might not be in the right spot. Now, one, one thing that I really love that you do within your organization, Garrison, is you have the kids, uh, it, it, do you have them take like a, a, a quiz or a self-assessment prior to the season and everyone signs off on that, correct? Um, so uh, we do a couple things. Uh, it, not exactly how you worded it, but we, we teach – for, you can't join our program unless you've gone through our freshman orientation yeah. class. Okay. Um, and that's a, a three part class. And we teach them everything from our core values and our mission and our vision. Um, we teach them some, you know, some, some, uh, we do a lot of stories and videos on, you know, t- mental toughness and things like that. But we also talk about how to survive high school and how to survive in our program as a whole, you know, so things like here's how we put our stuff away in our lockers to here's how you wash your uniform to, sit in the front row of class, turn in every assignment on time, you know, all those basic things. And we won't give a kid their pads until they've taken that class with us as a freshman. And then the other thing we do is before their senior year in the spring, before their senior year, we do a six part senior leadership course. And throughout that process, we, the seniors draft a team of underclassmen uh, and we do a scoring system based on things they show up to throughout the summer. And then in our second meeting, we, we establish our core values and, and define those in, uh, and what they're going to be for the season. And in the last four sessions, we teach lessons on the core values that the seniors came up for. So, and um, yep, go ahead. Uh, I, I I'd like a, kind of a copy of that because I, I I would like to uh, may, maybe incorporate that uh, w- within our own culture. I, I find that really interesting, Garrison. Yeah, for sure. I, um, so it changes literally every year for us. So I can send you the one. That, I mean, I can send you any of them, but I can mm-hmm. send you the one from this year where so. 
the thing that I think that we do, I, I mean, again, we're not by any means special. Where there's all kinds of programs all over the country that are teaching leadership courses and, and teaching their kids these things. But the one the one thing I think we do that's a little different is have our seniors pick the core values that we're going to use for that year. Um, you know, and that's that's something I just started doing in the last couple of years. You know, at first when I started doing it, I would say, here's our five core values for the year. Here's what they mean. Here's, you know, on Monday is going to be toughness Monday and on Tuesday is going to be energy Tuesday, you know, or whatever. Um, and now I've gotten the kids involved in that process. So I give them a word bank of about 60 words with definitions and we go through all of them and talk through that and, and what those look like. Um, and then they vote on them. And this year's seniors class was kind of cool. They wanted, they wanted to do the Tigers, our, our mascot as an acronym. So all our core values spell out Tigers and we have toughness, investment, grit, energy, relentless, and selfless. Um, so that was, that worked out kind of cool. Um, and then after we have those set, you know, I, I'm a big believer in, again, you know, what, why are we doing this? I, there's a big difference between, then b- between just throwing out six words and saying, these are the words that define us and actually defining them, you know, and I won't, I, I'll share this with anybody that wants it, but I, without going too much in depth, we will pick five or six true tangible things that you can tell are being met or not being met for each of our core values. And they're hanging on big signs outside our locker room. So for instance, just to go through toughness. Um, so our definition of toughness is we will be comfortable being uncomfortable. We will impose our will and dominate with toughness. But then we, under that, we have six, actually seven tangible things kids can do. So it's, I will finish every rep in the weight room. I will not make an excuse. I will compete to win my position group in the gasser every day. And the gasters are pre-practice sprint. Uh, I will often be heard, heard saying things like, so what, next play. I will not let a bad test grade slow me down. I will respond to being coached with a being coached with either a question or okay coach. You know, and so we have something like that for each of our core values. And, and I think that that goes a long ways. I think when kids can start seeing, okay, here are the exact things coach expects me to do. And it's right here in writing and, and I can see this. Then I think you're able to. You're a lot more likely to get those behaviors out of your kids. And 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 I truly, uh, I truly love that. Now th- this kind of goes into our next topic uh, relatively easily. Uh, your non-negotiables as a coach. What do you? What are your non-negotiables for your program? Um, so I guess I mean that's kind of a uh, it's a big question, but I, I guess I mean I could break that down based on my non-negotiables for our coaches and our non-negotiables for our players and. Um, you know, we don't have a ton of rules. I, I guess I'm a big believer in the more rules you have, the, the easier it is to break one. And once somebody's broke one, they might as well break them all. So we try and keep it pretty simple. Um, you know, for our coaches, I just ex- want high energy coaches. I want coaches that are just excited to be out there that kids can feed off of. Um, so we just have two tangible things. You know, number one is you can't coach without a whistle. And number two is you can't coach with your ho- hands in your pockets. And we figure so, and this is that's a Randy Schrader thing that I took from him when I got to Washington, and I just think is is freaking genius. It, it's simple. Um, anyone can, but I, I'll be I'll give coaches flybys and say, get your freaking hands out of your pockets, or where's your whistle? Uh, you know, it took about it didn't take any time at Washington. Those guys were already trained, but it took about three months at ADM, and we got that <laughs> rolling too. So had to, we we wouldn't let the coaches wear shorts with pockets for a couple couple weeks last year, but. Um, and then for our players, it's just three things, you know, and I think if you can get these three things out of your kids, you're going to be in a good spot. The first one is be early. The second one is pay attention. The third one is play as hard as you possibly can. Um, and again, you know, we don't have a ton of rules and, and we kind of let the, our kids be kids. But but at the end of the day, we, we got to have uh, we got to have kids that are bought in and are there and are listening to us and are playing as hard as they possibly can. So uh, I guess that's our non-negotiables. Coach Swanson. You know, I'm just enjoying listening to this. You know, Garrison, you seem like you have it really, you know, down really well with, you know, what you want your program to be about and the kids and how they hold themselves accountable. Um, you know, what, what do you do if some of the kids break the non-negotiables? What are some consequences you might have or something along those lines? You know, I, I didn't even have this in my notes to talk about, but it is a fun thing. So we have a, what we call the wheel of misfortune. Um, and I actually got this idea from another coach on a podcast a long time ago, and they were doing it for something um, – like basically their conditioning. They had their, all their conditioning options for the day on a wheel and the kids would spin the wheel. And so we took that and kind of made it to the, to the next level. And it's, we have this wheel with a bunch of different conditioning options on it and a free space. The free space is key. And anytime a kid breaks a rule violation, we just say, go spin the wheel. And I love this because it makes the wheel the bad guy, you know, and I understand as the head coach that every once in a while I have to be the bad guy and I don't have a problem doing that. 
but the wheel has been kind of a fun thing because it, you know it, it it enforces without really without any coach really having to enforce especially with the free space on there because you know it can be oh johnny i'm i'm sorry you missed uh, lifting this morning for the fourth time because your car wouldn't start again. And, you know, I believe you, I believe that your car didn't start again. And I really hope the football gods are shining down on you and you spend that free space. But, um, you know, so that's what we do. We, we used to be like everyone else, you know, first miss is a quarter of playing time. Second miss is the half of playing time. And, you know, at the end of the day, that just become not every absence is created equal and not every team violation is created equal, you know? So uh, I didn't really like having to enforce that. And sometimes it ended up, you know, a simple, literally power went out in your house and you missed missed lifting and uh now your team has to suffer because one of their best players was out a half you know i i never loved that so the wheel's been a great thing and the kids like it and uh you know it's a tangible thing anybody can put in their program so. i think that's a wonderful idea i'm gonna steal that from you right yeah. now because that is a wonderful idea i love it Remind me when we're when we're done with this, I'll shoot you over some pictures of our wheel. It's pretty good stuff. All right, sounds good. Now, now, Coach Carter, I got to know what's on the wheel of you know this wheel. All right, let me see if I can keep talking. I'll see if I can pull up a picture here, and I'll tell you the. All right, it's uh, it's it, it, it's always fun, don't you think, Coach Swanson, to to garner in all these new ideas to, to just just the accountability factor in general. Oh, yeah. You know, the best part about talking with coaches from all over, you know, we've talked to coaches from Texas and Utah and Iowa is hearing what they do differently. You know, hearing what, how they handle things, how they handle parents, how they handle conditioning like this. I mean, this is a wonderful idea. I love the conditioning wheel, the wheel of misfortune. That's a great tool, you know, and it's just a different way of doing things, you know, and I think it's just fascinating to see what all coaches have. All right, you guys ready for it? Here's some things on the wheel. Coach Banks, I just texted you over a, a video of our wheel in action. But, okay. Okay, we got, we got free space. Um, we got a double gasser. A, a gasser is a, a down back, down back from sideline to sideline. We got roll 100 yards and get up and run 100 yards. We have a 50-yard killer. We got a five-minute wall sit. Uh, we got roll 50, run 50. We got 50 burpees. Uh, spin again. Uh, a single gasser. 100-yard bag push. Um, and a position coach's choice. So, um, and those will probably actually be changed. And that picture was from last year. So we'll change those up a little bit this year. But, um, you know, again, it's a fun thing. And, you know, it, it kind of takes, I, I want to be careful how, how I word this. Cause I'm not trying to make light of kids breaking team violations, but, you know, in, in obviously some blatant things that, that have to be handled differently, you know, if you're breaking good conduct policies. But, you know, if you're, a minute late to lifting. We're not going to kick a kid off the team, you know, but it's funny. The kids will start chanting wheel, wheel, wheel at them. And, uh, <laughs> you know, and it just kind of make it kind of lightens, you know, instead of, instead of me, you know how it is. You guys have coached that, you know, it, you're starting running backs late for practice. And instead of being, you know, and it's really easy now to just be in a bad mood and be grumpy the rest of practice, or you can just watch them spin the wheel and kind of laugh it off and, and move on. So, uh, you know, that's one thing that's worked for us. And I, we started doing that at Washington and carry it over here, and it's been a hit both places. So. I like it. Uh, it's it, it's one of those things, Swanee, that, uh, that that I think we can utilize. Now, I just I just gave you a new uh, a new nickname on the CCA podcast, Swanee River. Swanee River, got yeah. it. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> okay, so uh, I I want to know if you're if you're having an issue, uh, whether, whether it's with uh, with a parent, a player. Or you know whatever. What what is your uh, like uh, your chain of command, Garrison? What are your expectations on trying to create that culture where where the kids uh, you know taking accountability and action for themselves? You know, taking that leadership role. Yeah, well, so you know, we talked a little bit about this, and and, and we try and I think with this. So the first time we meet for senior leadership, the only thing we do is put every kid uh, every kid's name on the board that's in our program. And our seniors do like a fantasy football type snake draft, right? Where they literally draft kids off their team. And then throughout the off season, kids are scoring points for things like uh, showing up to open gym, uh, showing up to weightlifting, you, you know, doing community service. Uh, we do take your GPA times 10 at the end of the school year is, is uh, what some of our points that they earn, all these things, right? And so what I like about that is we take the winner of that. So whatever senior team scores the highest, that senior is one of our four captains automatic. And I know that seems like a small thing, but what's become really cool about that is you have seniors that 
I mean, you know how it is. It, it, that's important to kids. They want to be one of those captains and, and they want their team to win. And we're creating a little competition throughout the off season with it. Um, so like this year we had uh, seniors calling kids, moms saying, you know, Hey, I drafted Jimmy to my team. I really want to be a captain at ADM. That means a lot to me. It would really help me if you could help get Jimmy to the weight room and remind him that when he's there, that helps me. Uh, so it's taking it off instead of me hammering on kids constantly to get in the weight room or do things in the off season. It's now coming from their seniors and their peers and the kids on their, on their little mini teams. And I think, I think that's been really good. And uh, that's something that we've done uh, literally since my first day at Seymour. And it was something we kind of stumbled onto and it, it's worked really well. Yeah. Now I, I coach Doherty says he loves that idea that, that the spinning wheel. So, so, so it might, it might make its way all the way through Southeast Iowa is what I'm going to guess. Now, tell him to tell him to give me a text. I'll get him a link. <laughs> Absolutely. Now let's, uh, let, you know, as we get into our last 14 minutes, can you believe it's gone this fast, Garrison? Unbelievable. It's, it, it's unbelievable. Uh, I, I don't think so because a lot of people would say, you know, Chuck could probably talk for five hours, but it is what it is. Let's talk about the coaches that have impacted who you are today. Yeah, you know, um, I, I'm probably like everyone, but but my high school coach really had a huge impact on me. It's, it's, uh, Jim Knott was his name from Centerville, and uh, and is the reason I'm in coaching. You know, and, and the one thing I always liked about Coach Knott and anyone that's kind of familiar from with the landscape of Iowa high school football, you know, Centerville is a, not a good job. You know, it, it's a so it, when we were going through high school, it was the smallest three A in the state. Um, you know, the socioeconomics in that area aren't the best. You have a lot of things working against you. Um, we never heard any of that. You know, we thought we were played in the best program in the state and, um, we thought every game we had a chance to win, you know, and now that I'm in coaching and it's 15 years later, I'm looking back and think, God, we shouldn't have beat any of those teams, you know? And, um, and, and a lot of that I thought came down to coach not, I, I thought he was unmatched as far as a program organizer. And, and I thought, just the fact that he refused to accept that Centerville couldn't be a good job. You know, I see a, a lot of that kind of wired into the way. There's a reason I keep taking all these 0 and 9 teams, right? It, it's, I think there's some hidden magic in every in every school, and I think I got that from from being around Coach Knott. And then uh, the other one would be probably Randy Schrader, who I followed at Washington, and, and obviously I've gotten to know really well. And, uh, you know, he's the, the – can't coach with your hands in your pockets came from him. But just seeing the things that he did – and the wars that he fought to build Washington into where it was when I got there uh, um, just really opened my eyes to, to, you know, the way that it really needs to be done. And um, so, and he's now down in the head coach at Savannah, Missouri, and he's probably someone you guys should get on the show because he, he is phenomenal and he could tell stories for, for hours. So I think those two guys would, would probably be my two biggest influences. Now, what, what about personally, you know, the, 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 the personal influence, where, where, where could you draw in for that? I, I know I didn't give you that question, so. Oh, that's fine. Uh, you know, I, I, again, I'm probably like most people, but I think my parents obviously played a, a huge role on, on the person I am today. And, you know, I, I, I grew up with especially a dad, but my mom too, that really never accepted that we couldn't do anything and, and wouldn't make excuses for us. You know, I, there's a reason I don't, really buy into participation trophies because my dad wouldn't have ever allowed that to happen. You know, he put always wanted us, he always wanted the best for us and he would always do anything he could to make sure we were successful, but he'd make sure we earned it, you know? And, and so um, I, th- I think that, you know, especially now as I'm getting older, I, I really appreciate those, those things that he did for me. And then, you know, obviously I've been personally, I've just, you know, again, you're kind of a, kind of a combination of the people you spend the most time with. And, and I'm fortunate enough to have some really good friends that are also head coaches around the state and, uh, so I get to bounce a lot of ideas off those guys and have a really good network of people that have kind of helped uh, support me and get me to where I'm at. So far, when you, when you look, uh, we'll, 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 we'll do this twofold. One, one is a player and one is a coach. So far, what are you looking back, what is the most fantastic memory that you've had either as a coach or as a player? Oh God, that, that one's tough, honestly. Um, you know, my, my favorite thing as a coach, I mean, there's so many games, like individual games that, that were, were, were a blast. And obviously, I love now as a coach, kids that have graduated and finished in our program and gone on to college, coming back and hanging around and, and being in touch with those guys. I uh, just had one of my former players get engaged and he actually te- texted me a couple of days before and asked if I thought had any ideas on how he could ask her. And he ended up using one of the ideas I gave him, you know, so things like that are really cool. Um, but I think that as far as just coaching, 
or the game of football itself. I, I thought coaching in the Shrine Bowl a couple of years back was, was really a, a special experience. I you know some of the guys I coached with in that game are, are literally my best friends in the, in the coaching profession now. And getting the opportunity to coach kids from all different programs throughout the state was a really eye-opening experience and, and got to kind of see how it's done in, in a bunch of different places and coach the best kids in the state. And, and I thought that was an awesome, awesome opportunity that, that this game's provided me. Now we got about 9.30 left. Uh, Evan, do you have any more questions? You know, I just got one. You know, coaching is such a difficult job to do. You have coaches being ran out of town left and right because of parents, no community support, so on and so forth. You know, what's some advice you would just give to any coach? Doesn't matter the sport who, you know, first year coach coming into it. You know, what's some advice you'd give to some of those younger coaches? Uh, you know, I, I guess um, there, there's probably two things. One, uh, you don't know what you think you know, right? You're probably not near as smart as you think you are. And two, ask, ask for help and, and ask people for things. You know, again, I, I, like I've said multiple times, I'll share anything we do. Not that, that I have any of the answers, but we're just in such a, an awesome profession where people want to give and people want to share and help you. And, you know, I think that was the one thing, if I could go back as a young coach and realize, you know, when I was intimidated and uh, didn't want to ask for any help and ask people for advice, I wish I would have, you know, and now that I've been in a position where, you know, people know who I am a little bit more and I've been part of teams that were successful and I, I feel like I can call people and ask and, uh, you know, but I've never had anybody say no to me, you know, so I guess my, my biggest, my biggest thing that I could offer out to anybody would be ask for help, ask for advice. If you don't know something, ask for it. If you want, Hey, what's your practice schedule? Ask five other coaches what they do. Um, and, and just learn, you know, and, uh, I, I guess that's the thing, you know, we have such a great pro professional community, especially in 2019 with Twitter and all these things that are out there. Just, uh, you know, study what other people are doing, especially the ones that are winning and, and do what they do. Don't try and overthink it. You know, that, that's, that's a great response. You know, I think that's one of the hardest things as, you know, a coach, especially a young one, is to ask the coaches that have done it before and see what they've done and just ask questions because we don't know everything. No coach knows anything. And so, you know, that's some really great advice. Yeah, absolutely. You know, you know I, think it's, uh, I, I think it's fun because I, I really think that uh, Coach Swanson uh, thought that I knew – you know nothing about basketball and lo and behold i ended up helping him out quite a little bit so i'm gonna throw i'm gonna toot my own damn horn right now oh you as go. you should as you should <laughs> all right so any any special shout outs i see that uh you know not not only is our old hometown uh big reds in the playoffs but my my school's going to be in the, the the baseball state tournament and your school hey yeah that you know i we, I mean, this is, I could go down the rabbit hole on this for, but, you know, one of the things that drew me to ADM as a whole was the opportunity to, one, rebuild the football program, but also just kind of have a hands on approach and be really involved with rebuilding the athletic department as a whole. You know, we have a phenomenal athletic director um, that has a great vision and supports us and, and allowed and has created this environment as uh, head coaches on the men's side to really collaborate and work together and, uh, you know, so it's really fun, obviously, to see our baseball kids having some success, and, and our track kids had a had a phenomenal year. So, uh, hopefully, we can get that running. I can't wait to get over to Principal Park and watch those guys play on Tuesday. It's uh, it, it's pretty awesome. You know, you know the, the the best thing that could possibly happen is if it's ADM versus Centerville in the finals of three A, huh? Hey, that'd be pretty cool. I, I could definitely <laughs> get behind that. <laughs> Well, all right. Uh, any any special shout outs, Garrison, besides your wife that, uh, you know, for, for a, a football wife is a special person. Yeah, they're right. They're, we couldn't even give her anywhere near enough credit in, in the next, last five minutes we're on here. But but she's phenomenal. And, and obviously, uh, you know, she plays a huge fact, a huge role in the fact that we're here, you know, so um, I can't thank her enough. She, she puts up with me and I know we're getting to that time of year where uh, I'm not home very much. And I know that that puts a lot of strain on her and, and we're expecting our first baby. So she's got a little double, double stress level on her right now, but uh, yeah, she's phenomenal. Um, obviously I, I, I would be remiss if I didn't give a shout out to our assistant coaches. Honestly, they're probably the ones that should be on here. Uh, that was another thing that drew me to ADM was get the opportunity to really start from scratch and build the staff we wanted. And, and we had, I, the, the staff of guys that we have in this football program, I mean, our kids are spoiled. We, I, I genuinely believe we have the best coaching staff in the state. And you know, that goes a long ways. I think you're only as good as the guys you work with. And, and our guys are, are freaking awesome. And they put in the time and they, they're 
they're smart and they want to learn and they want to get better and they challenge each other to, to continue to work. And um, so those guys are awesome. And then I touched on a little bit with our, with our AD, but our whole administrative team is, is freaking awesome and really supportive to the vision we have and do a great job of kind of staying out of our way, but just clearing the path for us to, to work and, and do what we think is right to build this thing up. So, uh, you know, I, again, I, I appreciate the platform to thank all those guys publicly. All right. Uh, give me give me just a few moments here. I'm going to mute you too, but be sure to stay on here till the end if you don't mind. Yep, no problem. All right. Uh, you've been listening to CCA, uh, you know, tonight, uh, head ADM football coach Garrison Carter. Uh, he, he's got a special place in my heart because I, you know, I, I, I've got to see him blossom into the coach that he is today. And, uh, and also, you know, I had that opportunity. I, I was at the freshman level, but I, but I got to see Garrison uh, roll through as a player as well. Folks, uh, tonight's broadcast, as well as the very next broadcast that you're going to see uh, here in just a few moments, is uh, sponsored by the Mad Culture Present in Athletics Today. Get your copy. It's out. Uh, I, I'm actually selling the copies for 15 bucks. That includes shipping. Coaches, uh, you know, if you want to get the book for your coaching staff as well, it's 15 bucks for the first book and 7 bucks after if you want to get one for your entire staff. Guys, for everybody within CCA, and uh, be sure to stay tuned here. You're going to have to refresh, but we'll be back on here in just about 15 minutes with our second show this evening. Good night, lots of love, and, and we'll see you soon.